Um, you're all set, Kate. Um, so thanks, Gary, for organizing the weekly seminar series, and thanks for everyone who's joining. Um, I know it's kind of a weird week with a long weekend and school vacation, but we appreciate everyone here. Um, so John and I gave a talk a few months ago at the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions fall conference on uh, Doc and Peter impacts, and we thought a more general talk about environmental review would be a good fit for the seminar series. So today we're just gonna talk about um, environmental review at the agency and a little bit of history, um, what our role is, and then John's gonna kind of highlight some of the research that our um, program has done because of what's been highlighted during our review over the past decade. <clears throat> so I wanted to start with just a little bit of history, um, environmental review and how it became under the Habitat program. So since the mid 1960s, DMF has acted in an advisory capacity to local town, state and federal permitting agencies. And originally it was part of the shellfish program under Mike Hickey because it mainly involved uh, dredging fill projects. And then in 1972, the Wetlands Protection Act was implemented and regulations required permitting agencies to consult with us. So the shellfish program and other DMF biologists would review and provide comments. And then on federal actions, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act required US Fish and Wildlife Services to consult with fish and wildlife agencies. And then during the 1980s, review um, became the responsibility of the area teams, which later evolved into the sport fish program. So this was um, led by Paul Caruso, Brad Chase, and Greg Scomel. And then in 1999, due to time demands of environmental review and the need to kind of establish uh, consistency with our comments, it was consolidated under Vin, Vin Malkowski. So his team included uh, Stephanie Cunningham, Eileen Feeney, Matt Camisa, Frank Germano, and Tay Evans. And then in 2007, the project was placed in the new fish uh, habitat program under Catherine Ford. So <clears throat> environmental review has been part of this agency for decades, um, it's, there's been a range of programs who have kind of been in charge of overseeing it. And um, it's currently under the Habitat program, but it's still kind of important for all the different projects and programs to kind of coordinate together and um, provide comments when needed. So I just kind of want to give a big shout out and thanks to all the other biologists who help us on kind of a weekly basis, um, the diadromous folks, shellfish and lobster, um, and then to the folks in Austin who help us with coordinating letters. And then just to introduce our team and our, our current team right now. So we've got folks in both field offices. We've got Tay, Forrest and I in the Gloucester office and we're in charge of reviewing projects between the New Hampshire and Hull border or New Hampshire border and um, Hull. And then we've got Eileen and John in the New Bedford office and they review projects between Cohasset, um, Cape Cod and the islands. And then they get help from Ryan with uh, file management <clears throat> because they review about two thirds of the projects that um, we, we receive and review. And then Catherine Ford is the lead of our program and she helps um, oversee some of the larger projects, things like offshore wind and aquaculture. Um, so just to back up about what environmental review is for those of you who aren't familiar with the process, um, our, the habitat team, reviews coastal alteration projects, coastal alteration projects through various stages of permitting. And we provide comments to these different uh, permitting agencies. So we deal with the town and city conservation commissions, MassDEP, um, MEPA, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. And then below each agency is a list of uh, permits that they're responsible for issuing. Um, so depending on the various project and kind of the size and location of the project, uh, a, certain project can require different permits. And sometimes this can take years and a lot of meetings and site visits. Um, so it definitely can be time, uh, time consuming. And essentially, DMF provides fishery expertise to these permitting agencies in an advisory function. Um, so we don't issue any permits, we just act kind of in an advisory role. And our goal is always to avoid impacts and then minimize impacts and then finally mitigate any impacts that can't be um, avoided to important fisheries, resources, and habitats. So like I mentioned, uh, Vin Malkowski really started 
and his team really helped um, create the database and help organize the review process. But in the early 2010 um, period timeframe, we started asking more questions of the review process, kind of what projects are we reviewing most often, what habitats are being impacted and how much, um, what about indirect impacts, and then kind of what are the next steps? Um, are there any data gaps? Are there any additional research um, we could do to help supplement our review and kind of our recommendations? <clears throat> So in 2013, we transitioned to an access database and started recording more project information. So now we record specific lat long of every project and this helps us link our database to uh, Google Earth or ArcGIS. Um, we also record impact size. So what the potential project impact would be. Um, and we try to do this in a couple of different ways and it's kind of always evolving and we're trying to always figure out a better way to do this. But the two different ways we do this are recording the permanent direct impact. Um, and that's kind of the obvious loss of habitat. Um, and then kind of the more difficult way um, impacts that we record are kind of like the temporary indirect or shading impact. So an example would be if you have kind of this picture shows like a standard dock and pier project, the permanent direct habitat would just be, or impact would just be from the pilings, you know, the square footage loss um, or the square footage of the habitat loss of the pilings. But then there's also <clears throat> potential shading from the pier, the gangway, and the floats, especially if there's salt marsh and eelgrass underneath. And then we also record um, what the project type is, if it's a dock, a hard shoreline, or a dredge project, and then what habitat types are being impacted, um, like eelgrass or salt marsh. So the rest of my talk, I'll be focusing kind of on this five year. Um, time frame between 2015 and 2019. And just in five years, we reviewed approximately 2,000 projects. Um, so each point kind of represents where a project is located or a potential project. And so that's about 400 projects a year that we review. Um, and like I mentioned, each, each project may require a number of permits. Um, but I do want to note that these projects may not necessarily happen. These are just projects that we're reviewing permits for. So that's kind of the downside of our database and the information that we know. Um, we just don't have the resources to kind of track, okay, is this project, did it go through? Is it gonna happen? Um, did our recommendations make it into the permit? So that's something maybe one day we'll be able to know more information about. And like I mentioned, we keep track of different project types. Um, and we kind of started wondering a few years ago, what do, what do we spend the most time reviewing? So every year um, we review a lot of dock and pier projects, hard shoreline projects and drench projects. And just in the five years, it was almost 600 private or residential docks, about 400 hard shoreline projects. These include things like sea walls, riprap and bulkhead projects, about 200 commercial dock projects, things like marinas or public wharfs and 150 dredge projects. Um, but we do re review a variety of things, cables and pipelines, culverts, bridges, um, and sometimes a project can include multiple types. So for example, in this picture on the top right, you can see a boat ramp with some docks, uh, with some floats attached, or sometimes we'll review um, a shoreline protection project, but they're also doing offshore beach, or um, they're doing beach fill or offshore sedimenting. Uh, depositing sediment offshore. So um, yeah, we review, review a lot. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of highlight the net because we review so many private and commercial docks. Um, this is the map just highlighting in blue. You can see where the private docks are located or the potential private docks and in red where the commercial docks are. And basically anywhere along the coast, um, you'll see a point. And there's just a couple areas where it makes sense that you won't see too many, um, kind of along the end of the Cape, where the, Na the Cape Cod National Seashore is, um, along Plymouth, where there's, you know, it's susceptible to coastal erosion and high winds. You're not gonna really see any docks there. And then up along uh, Plum Island. But everywhere else there's a potential um, for a dock. Someone is most likely gonna try to get one. Um, and John's going to be talking about this during his talk, but for the past few years, we've been working on creating a best management practices recommendation document for dock and peers um, with the goal to kind of help streamline our review and to um, 
offer permitting agencies, you know, what our standard recommendations are going to be and how we can recommend better to avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts. And like I mentioned, we try to, sorry about my dog, um, we try to quant quantify the size of these impacts um, and calculate the square footage of each project in our database. So in the five years of those 2000 projects, um, in our database, we recorded about 50% of those projects have had some kind of direct impacts and it kind of seems kind of low, but um, sometimes we're just reviewing, you know, a repair project or an upland project. So when, we, when I mentioned direct impacts, that's really like a loss of habitat because of the project. Um, and that's what we recorded the log for direct impacts. And these impacts range from just one square foot up to 1.8 million square feet. So our largest project five years in the past five years was a federal dredge project in Nantucket Harbor. And that was almost 42 acres. And then if you calculate the total potential impact of all these projects, it's about 151 acres. And then this graph kind of shows the range of impacts. So it's not surprising that we review um, a lot, lot of small projects and a few uh, larger projects, but typically like our dock and pier projects are around hundred square feet or less. And then we have um, our hard shoreline projects and then our dredge and fill projects are typically the larger ones, greater than 10,000 square feet or um, like approximately a quarter acre. And then just to kind of highlight um, what, what I meant when I was talking about indirect impacts. So impacts that you may not think about when reviewing a project. Um, and these are some examples from around Massachusetts um, from boating, from indirect boating impacts. So in the top left, you'll see some crop dredge impacts in eelgrass from West Falmouth. That's just from one, one boat that's kind of circling around a mooring that it's on. And then the bottom left, you can see some chain dragging through eelgrass. Um, Again, these, this is some mooring impacts. And then on the right, you'll see some pretty large floats that are in Marblehead. And so not only is there a pier gangway and a really large float, they've got some, they've got um, multiple vessels attached, some jet skis and some swim platform, swim <clears throat> platforms. And they, this can lead to additional shady impacts. So uh, John's gonna be talking about some of the studies that we're working on and, and doing to address some of these indirect impacts. So how are our resources being Im impacted? Um, this is a slide showing the number of projects that have the potential to impact eelgrass. And eelgrass is a marine plant that grows in shallow coastal waters in Massachusetts. And it's important nursery habitat for our marine fishery species. Um, and this a picture on the left is from one of our restoration sites. And so each of these blue dots kind of represents where a project is with the potential to impact eelgrass. And then there's a color gradient for the town. So the darker the color green, uh, the more projects um, in that town. And then again, John's gonna talk a little bit more about this upcoming study from Dock and Pier Impacts to Eelgrass. But this is a picture, um, like a Google, this is a Google Earth image from Marblehead. And if you can imagine the pictures I just showed you previously, when you have a pier and then you can't see the attached floats, but they would kind of be in this area with their floats and then their attached vessels. Um, this is a side scan, scan image overlaying that Google Earth image that we took this past summer. And it can kind of, the red outlines the boundaries of where the eelgrass. So the dock and pier impacts have kind of led to this bed fragmentation in Marblehead. And um, John's gonna talk about that in a little bit, but that's just one of the ways dock and piers uh, have been impacting eelgrass over the past few years. And then similar to the previous slide, the slide is focusing on salt marsh. Um, so of the almost 2000 projects, about 20% have the potential to impact uh, salt marsh and about 60% of those projects are because of dock and piers. Um, so again, John is gonna get into this next, but John had, has done some research to learn more about the dock and pier impacts to salt marsh. And kind of our motto, for the review team is kind of avoid, minimize, and mitigate impacts. And for those of you who are not familiar with our time of year document in 2011, Tay, Catherine, Brad Chase, and John Shepard um, published this time of year restrictions document. And it defines um, a seasonal or time of year restriction window um, when a project should avoid in-water work. So 
these species can be protected based on their like most <clears throat> um, important, uh, sorry, sorry, based on their anticipated lethal, sublethal behavioral impacts in that location. So we've recommended um, a time of year for just about 20% of the projects that we reviewed. And that's just one of, our, one of the tools that we use on a monthly basis. And then in terms of mitigation, on the other side of that, um, when a project can't avoid or minimize impacts, we recommend projects um, mitigate for the impacts they had. So in 2013, uh, the Inlu Fee Program was started and DFG sponsors and administ administers this program uh, for Massachusetts. And so basically um, it allows applicants to pay an Inlu Fee to um, this program if their project's gonna impact um, federally regulated aquatic resources. So, and then in turn, DFG will aggregate these fees and implement larger scale mitigation proje projects. So we recommended about 10% of the projects we've reviewed um, for this program. And then before I hand it over to John, I just wanted to give a little um, quick shout out to this project Catherine and I have been working on. So we've created this ArcGIS online web map. And if you have an account for ArcGIS online with our agency, you, you should be able to access it. And it's just got um, a, a bunch of great layers that you can access, um, including shellfish, eelgrass, our artificial reef sites, um, the location of different DMF surveys like our um, trawl survey, um, ocean plan layers, and then fisheries regulations. And so this is kind of an example um, insert, you can see Plymouth and Duxbury Bay, and where you can see salt marsh in blue and eelgrass in orange. So um, feel free to check it out and reach out to us if you have any questions. And I'll just hand it over to John. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. Let me just share my screen. All right, and see that, okay? Assume yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone. Thanks, Kate, for the um, first part of our talk. So for the last little bit of the talk today, I'm just gonna give a very general and very brief overview of some of the sorts of applied research and monitoring our program also does to directly inform this environmental review process. And again, uh, I think Kate's mentioned a couple of times now our sort of our motto of avoid, minimize, and mitigate. So I try to give a couple examples of projects that we have done that have directly informed each of these three facets of environmental review. All right, so as a starting point, really uh, one of our roles in, in the way that we interface with the permitting agencies is to be the ones that really keep on top of the scientific literature that's relevant to the different sort of construction projects that we're reviewing. And so not just to review it, I mean, on top of it, but really to distill it down into a form that's easily digestible and easily um, implemented into permit conditions. And so we definitely do this on a case-by-case -case basis in all of our individual letters that we write, but we also occasionally try to take this exercise and turn it into um, physical documents that agencies and consultants and other stakeholders can use to have all the, the necessary information they would need about these topics. So Kate mentioned earlier that dredging and dock projects are two of the ones that we see without a doubt uh, most commonly across the state. So these were two ones where we felt like it was worth our time to spend the time and really create a formal document that synthesizes this literature, re literature review process. So Kate referred to this time of year tech report that we put out in 2011. And it's actually a nice document that really gives all the underlying biology that, that explains the, the rationale for all of our time of year restrictions and also provides data on really um, system by system information on what resources are present. So it's been a really good resource for permitting agencies as well as the consultants as they're planning their, their projects. And then a more recent example that actually we just submitted for peer review last week. Um, it's a literature review that we just uh, completed that looks at all of the potential impacts of, of docks and piers on the aquatic environment. And so it's a nice synthet synthesis of the existing literature. And then on top of that, we provide our best management practices that are directly informed from that, from that literature review. Uh, so, of course, literature reviews only get you so far. There's always going to be gaps in the existing um, scientific body of literature. 
And in some cases, you know, it, it makes sense for us as, as an entity to go out and try to do the applied research to fill some of those gaps. So starting with impact avoidance, um, impact avoidance is often a tricky thing, um, except when it's a temporal impact. So, you know, temporal impacts, would be, good examples of this would be dredging projects, cable laying, where the actual physical disturbance from the construction can impact the environment. But there's probably not gonna be a lasting alteration of the habitat. Um, and so that's where our time of year uh, recommendations tend to come into play. Now of all these time of year recommendations, our winter flounder time of year, which you can see in the table above, covers pretty much all the winter and spring months across the state and also uh, is applied to really every single embayment in the state of Massachusetts. So it's definitely our most conservative time of year restriction. And for that reason, it definitely creates the most um, contention and sort of the most uh, resistance from, from applicants in, a, in applying it. So in an effort to try to refine, refine this uh, uh, time of year recommendation and make it a little more specific, we've just started to launch an environmental DNA study of winter flounder distribution, at least for the southern part of the state. So the idea here is to take a bunch of water samples across a number of embayments over a number of years, um, have them analyzed for winter flounder eDNA and use this information to better understand sort of where and when flounder are really aggregating. And in turn to use those data to inform where and when really to pull their feet down and, uh, and enforce these time of year restrictions. So for kind of physical constru construction projects, avoidance often isn't really feasible. Really if you're putting any sort of physical structure in the water or over the water, it's probably gonna have some sort of um, some sort of impact to the marine environment. And that's where minimization becomes kind of our next tool. And just like avoidance, uh, proper minimization really requires proper science to guide it. So Kate mentioned earlier, docks are our most common project that we see. And she also highlighted just how ubiquitous they are in the salt marsh environment. Uh, we did an over a, a look probably about five years ago at just the number of docks over salt marsh already in place and it, it was close to 3000. So it's really a, a kind of structure that has a real potential for cumulative impacts. And so about five years ago, we conducted two um, complementary field studies, both of them basically looking at different dock designs and how they influence light penetration as well as marsh growth. Um, and then we've used these data in the time since completing the study is to really directly inform our comment letters. So now our comment letters can really provide highly detailed recommendations that have some, you know, some good science to back them up gives a little more teeth to our letters. So a pretty similar complementary study that's in the works for this upcoming summer. It's gonna be led by Salem Sound Coast Watch and we'll be, um, we'll be technical partners on the project. And it's really looking at some of the same questions, uh, it, but instead of, of looking at uh, intertidal impacts to docks over salt marsh, we're gonna be looking at subtidal impacts to the floats at the end of docks over eelgrass. And it's really gonna be asking some of the same questions. So we'll be looking at light trans transmission under these floats, and eelgrass health. And in this case, in, instead of looking at it in relation to dock design, we'll be looking at it in relation to um, um, float depth. So hoping to find a depth at which point you can actually sustainably install floats. And our main contribution to this project will be doing side scan sonar. So the image in the bottom of this image, which I think Kate showed earlier as well, highlights some of the areas that we've shown in side scan where the, where the bed's already fragmented, where, where floats some floats are in place. So direct impacts tend to be pretty straightforward and intuitive um, and easy to anticipate. So, you know, going back to the dock example, if you're putting a, bu putting a bunch of piles into a salt marsh platform, obviously the area of those piles is gonna be habitat conversion, lost, lost habitat, and you'd look to mitigate for that directly. Indirect impacts can be a lot trickier to anticipate and to quantify, both in terms of their extent and, th and their nature. And that's where really, um, it's really important to have proper monitoring. So. In most cases, uh, the applicant would be hiring out a consulting firm to do this monitoring work. And so in most cases, our job really is to scrutinize their monitoring plans and make sure that they're, they're legit, that they're, they're robust enough to really quantify it and, and whether an impact is occurring. But every once in a while, we get involved in these monitoring projects directly ourselves. So one big example of this was the major beach nourishment project that happened down here about five years ago. It was uh, for Town Neck Beach, which is the beach that uh, borders the um, Cape Cod Bay entrance to the Cape Cod Canal it was highly, highly eroded. And our main concern going to the project was that there were a number of really large, healthy eelgrass eel beds right offshore, as well as some important cobble habitat. And we we're concerned that the nourishment material might move offshore and kind of smother these habitats. So for the past five years, we've been going out and doing side scan sonar and um, drop cam imagery monitoring of these beds and this habitat to see how it changed or hasn't changed in response to nourishment. And the good news is that the cobble and as well as the eelgrass have really stayed pretty much intact over this time. So it's providing maybe a unique case where monitoring, actually, where I'm sorry, mitigation actually may not be required. 
All right, so there, of course, are many other examples where uh, <laughs> monitoring does demonstrate that mitigation is necessary or there is just direct impacts that are, that are, that are known to happen. And in this case, it becomes a question of using the using best science to determine which mitigation strategies will have the best success. So Kate alluded to this briefly in the first part of the talk, but there's these structures called conservation mooring systems. So again, a, a typical chain chain and block mooring that would be installed in the eelgrass bed, it tends to cause scouring around the periphery of, of where it's anchored. So you tend to get these sort of donut holes in the eelgrass bed. And so these conservation mooring systems, at least in theory, they have an elastic road which suspends that line above the bottom. So instead of scouring, it keeps it up suspended in the water column. And the thought was that if you put these in place of old uh, traditional moorings in an eelgrass bed, that the eelgrass would be able to recolonize and be a way of mitigating for impacts. But again, the efficacy really hadn't been tested when this first started going through as a mitigation strategy. So our Glossier team did a five-year survey of some of these systems that were put in place in West Falmouth Harbor. And uh, again, like all these slides I'm showing today, it could be the, the, you really could spend a whole talk just talking about this one project. But their main take home is that, yeah, it looks like these, these systems can work, but I think the devil's a bit in the details. It, it looks like really you need to make sure that you have proper cleaning and maintenance of the systems to avoid scouring. So it's, it's kind of one of these cases where we learned a lot that, you know, it's not just as simple as installing these and walking away. You really need to properly maintain them for them to have their intended benefit. Okay, so in terms of eelgrass mitigation, as many of you probably know, our Glossier team spends quite a bit of time directly involved in uh, eelgrass restoration in the form of eelgrass plantings. So uh, this team has been involved in a number of projects directly mitigating for construction related impacts to eelgrass. And really eelgrass planting is sort of a science in and of itself. It's a really, it's really tricky business and doing it properly and doing it in a way that really uh, maximizes success relies upon proper methods that rely upon proper science to demonstrate which methods work and which don't. And so the team's done a really great job of integrating research into all of their um, restoration projects. And one good example of that, which is going on right now, is, is a collaboration with Northeastern where they're looking at eelgrass genetic diversity and seeing how that may influence um, the success of the plantings that they're doing. And that could really drive um, future restoration projects into determining which donor eelgrass they, they rely upon for these projects. All right, as many of you may know, we also have an artificial reef pro program, which is within the Habitat Project. This is led by Mark Rousseau and Kate. And there have been instances where this program has received mitigation funds to compensate for cases where construction projects have resulted in lost habitat. And so the idea here is that the reefs would provide habitat enhancement, um, provide some rocky complex bottom that could provide fisheries habitat. And of course, like all these other things, it makes sense in theory, but really it's important to properly monitor these sites to make sure that they're, they're achieving their intended goals. And so Kate and Mark for the past several summers have been putting out what they call BRUV systems. So these are baited remote underwater video systems which capture images on the seafloor. Um, and this way you can compare uh, the sites of the artificial reefs with some natural hard bottom to see, uh, and you essentially can quantify the fish communities to, to see whether or not you're seeing the same fish species composition, same fish sizes, et cetera, across your artificial reefs in relation to hard bottom, see whether you're really replicating the habitat you're trying to recreate. Um, and that's kind of all I have. Again, it was a really quick whirlwind overview, but I think the point of today's talk really was just to give everyone a really broad introduction into the, the sorts of things we do and how they uh, are all involved in the environmental review process. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to us this morning. Again, one of the uh, shout out to Gary for organizing this. And this has been a really great seminar. I've really enjoyed I'm listening to these each week and I really hope this is something that sort of carries on post pandemic as well. I think it's a really nice way to see what everyone in the division is working on. And then finally beyond that, just, just another shout out to the whole division. Um, as Kate alluded to, I mean, environmental review between the actual um, permit review we do and, and the applied research, it really is something that, that is inter interdisciplinary within the program, really re involves pretty much every project within DMF. So I just want to thank all the people that have been involved in the permit review as well as the, the applied research ends of this project. And then finally, the, uh, the URL I put up there, that's uh, something we just created on the MassGov website. It lists all of the various habitat reports and publications um, that our project put out, and um, most of which I just described in, in the past few slides. Um, so with that, I guess uh, Kate and I will take any questions you have. And again, thanks for your time.